All right. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Can you tell me whether I you can I can be heard properly? Like. Uh, Yes, yes, we can hear. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much indeed for joining with us today. Uh, welcome to another session of, uh, of Inspire, organized by the Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeni. Now, as you already know, the like Inspire is organized to spark light, to offer motivation, and bring joy and courage to all, all our undergraduates and everybody who loves science. You know, here we invite uh, scientists from different parts of the world. Now, who has courage to take the role that has never taken before? Today, we have such a wonderful individual sharing his thoughts on teaching, learning, and seeking new knowledge. My dear friends, colleagues, and students, now you all lie in the comfort of your home, surrounded by the people you love the most. Temperature is just perfect. And I can see the Hantan Hills surrounded by the mystical mist. Maybe, just maybe, all what you need is that favorite cup of coffee. Please join hands with us to celebrate how a great personality in Mayor and how he transformed the lives of many other young individuals in time to come. With that welcome note, uh, it is my humble pleasure to invite Professor Gamini Rajapaksa, Senior Professor in Chemistry, to introduce today's speaker. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ajira. Uh, my dear friends, colleagues, and students, it is indeed a great pleasure and privilege for me to formally introduce Professor Jim Navaratna Bangara, who actually has no introduction to this university community. Professor Bandara was a dear teacher to almost all of us uh, in this forum. His 40 years of dedication to university teaching and research is truly commendable and unmatchable. Let me mention a few of his uh, unique services. Uh, Professor Bandara is an expert in electronics, computer science, and in, in instrumentation, in addition to his major expertise in chemistry. He was instrumental in initiating the electronic research lab in our department and is the founder head of the department of uh, statistics and computer science. In fact, he actually initiated this computer science department. Professor Bandara's services to the department, university, other universities and industries in this country and also in other countries, in terms of bringing broken instruments to life is extraordinary. Let me quote just one example out of several hundreds. When our XRD machine was broken and the technicians came from the parent company demanded 2 million rupees to repair, we were actually helpless. We did not have that money. So what Professor Bandar did was he fixed it by checking all the electronic components one by one and by replacing just one resistor at a cost of two rupees. So two rupees uh, in, com in comparison to a million rupees. So I had a great luck to collaborate with my uh, research activities and to get advices from Professor Bandara ever since I returned to this university in the year 1991 after completing my PhD. Professor Bandar is not only a dear teacher and an excellent researcher, but also a role model for an ideal human energy, human energy. I was trying to recall whether he had any weakness out of all these goodnesses. I don't know whether it's a weakness or so. I will prove that it is not a weakness, it's a strength, but uh, what I remember is this one. He has given a final year research project uh, much earlier than the year that uh, electronic conducting polymers are discovered accidentally on the conversion of natural rubber, that is, uh, as we all know, polycystic spray to polyacetylene by uh, bromination of double bonds followed by dehydrobromination. So that Final year report is still with us in the department. And uh, Professor Bandar did, did this work much earlier than 
the year where Shirakawa, Macdemir, Dan Alan Heger discovered uh, these uh, first polyacrylate as, a, as an electron conducting polymer, for which actually they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry of the year 2000. Although Professor Bandar could have claimed that he, uh, he is in fact, uh, uh, he made this polyacetylene uh, of metal-like polymer much earlier than the year uh, they discovered, but he did not do so. But he was happy to see that the work he did several years ago got the highest recognition. In fact, as you see, it is not a weakness, it is it's his strength. So I can keep on talking about Professor Bandara, but I should let him talk to you. So therefore, let me very gratefully invite our great teacher, Professor Bandara, to uh, start his presentation. Professor Bandara, please. Hello, did you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can, we can hear, but you better turn your video on, sir. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, could you hear what I was telling? No, now we can hear you. Oh, sorry. I will repeat it again. Ah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. I'm Raju Paksha for the nice introduction. And uh, first of all, let me thank the head of the Department of Chemistry, Professor and the members of the staff for initiating this uh, inspired lecture series, which has been, you know, received well over the entire globe. And then I also should thank the entire inspired team, the entire team who is, uh, you know, arranging all these seminars. Now, <clears throat> let me start my talk, 40 years of teaching, learning, and research. And uh, here is a summary of my <laughs> academic journey. And uh, I entered this university in 1967, right? Long before many of you were born, I think. And uh, then in 1971, I did the final degree examination. And since 1972, I served the Department of Chemistry until I retired as a senior professor in 2013. And after retiring, still I continued my work until 2017. And uh, in 2017, I think I uh, stopped lecturing for the undergraduate students. And now, 
as a national service, I have been the controlling chief examiner of chemistry for the GC advanced level examination from 2006 to 2010. And uh, that's a brief uh, introduction to my career and uh, <clears throat> now <clears throat> yeah you can see some of my teachers and uh, I couldn't get the photograph of Professor H.W. Dias and uh, on to the extreme left on the top row is uh, Professor Swaran, and he was my research supervisor who supervised my final year project. And then we have uh, Professor Kuma, and Professor Sahib Kuma, and uh, I have no photograph for Professor H. W. Dias. And then the lower row, I have some photographs of my collaborators, and uh, I have at least one publication with these collaborators and uh, on the extreme left is uh, Professor Lindford from the University of Leicester, UK. Sorry? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear. We can hear you. Oh, yeah. And next uh, is uh, Alkiria and then Professor Ratnagar Bandara, all of you know him, and then Professor Le Peruma. And uh, so I skipped one. Here, <clears throat> we have a few more collaborators. On the extreme left, on the top row is uh, Professor Murakami from University of Shizuoka in Japan, and then the well-known character, Professor Dami Rajabaksh is there. And then Professor Lakshman Vishanayaka, who was in the physics department, and then Professor B.S.B. Karnaratna, again in the physics department. And then the lower row, we have Professor Shimamura from Japan. And uh, then the final photograph is uh, Professor Kuma, Kumar, who is now working in the NIFS. <clears throat> and uh, again, I am uh, skipping some slides, sorry. No. <clears throat> Uh, this slide shows the, you know, <clears throat> the problem I tackled during my final year research project, that is a reduction of tetracyclone, which is 2, 3, 4, 5 tetraphenyl cyclopentadienol. And uh, this is the hindered carbonyl. And uh, my task was to find the method to reduce this. And uh, if I'm correct, I think I remember there are about at least 11 different methods for the reduction of a carbonyl group. And people have tried all these 11, but uh, the yields were very low. <clears throat> the product expected was the saturated compound with CH2 here. And uh, then uh, we started trying the reduction of this compound. And uh, uh, finally, we could reduce this compound uh, and get the yield of uh, more than 90%. And uh, <clears throat> the work I did was, uh, you know, continued and uh, completed by uh, one of my junior batchmates, that is Rajasekara. And the results were published in Tetrahedron in uh, 1974, and that's the first publication. And uh, it came out of my research. And uh, I wanted to tell this because especially I am aiming at the final year 
chemistry special students who are doing their project and uh, if you do it with dedication and determination you can be sure that your results can be published so i included this to include uh, to to encourage our young scientists right and that's the first publication i had and then <clears throat> uh let's go on this uh, slide professor rajabaksha has already talked about this and uh, you can see the structure of natural rubber here and uh, it came to my mind now if you can see this double bonds if you remove the double bonds and introduce two double bonds you remove this and introduce one double bond there and one there in each of the units repeating units then you will end up with the compound that is given at the bottom and uh, if you look at that carefully it is a conjugated polymer and uh, now it is similar to the polyacetylene that is the polyacetylene is the first conducting polymer that was discovered and three people got the nobel prize for that and uh, if you look at this structure it is nothing but polyacetylene with methyl substitution right so we recognize this and uh, i wanted to convert this natural rubber to this polymer and uh, i gave this as a research problem to several students in the final year and i think the third student if i remember correctly uh, was able to do this we tried so many different reaction conditions and so on and uh, finally we got this product the conjugated polymer given at the bottom and uh, this was the yellow compound and uh, so there is conjugation and uh, then we doped it with iodine once it is doped with iodine we got a you know graphite like shiny black compound which was highly conductive so <clears throat> this is a conductive polymer and this is the first example where a natural polymer has been converted into a conductive polymer and uh, the research report is in the department and uh, uh, it's a you know great piece of work because uh, it's the first instance where a natural polymer has been converted to a conductive polymer now this was done by bromination followed by the hydrobromination so if you bromate this you will get the compound in the center and when you dehydrobromate it again you will end up with the final product and uh, the reactions were not easy because the uh, normal bromination of rubber gives various compounds but uh, finally however we were able to get this product and uh, it was a successful story about converting a natural polymer to a conducting polymer and uh, then uh, i am telling about this because uh, this a uh, piece of interesting work that i could do on my sabbatical in uk where <clears throat> you know i had the chance to work in this uh, synchrotron radiation facility in uh, manchester dasbury and uh, that's a rare occasion you know uh, you know only few people will get the chance to work in a in a cyclotron and uh, here we did some experiments uh, on uh, polymer metal salt complexes and uh, we were doing xf xafs that is x ray absorption fine structure and xans that is uh, chains X-ray absorption near edge structure. These are X-ray methods, which are not very common, 
uh, because you can do this only when there is synchrotron or high energy space available. And uh, out of this work, we could produce uh, three, you know, papers, uh, and uh, they are all related to the, you know, interaction of uh, metal salts with uh, polymers, and. Uh, That's, uh, you know, a field that I like very much. And uh, really, we could produce uh, three papers uh, within that year. And then I'll come to this uh, story about prosthetic manufacture. And actually, this was introduced to you in the first seminar that was given by Professor Rajapaksha. You may remember that he told you that uh, we had a multidisciplinary research project and uh, we were able to, you know, manufacture or produce two, you know, joints. That is one, the elbow joint for a small girl and the knee joint for a grown-up man. And, uh, you know, this uh, manufactured and then the operations were done by uh, done in the Peradena hospital by uh, Dr. Uh, I have forgotten the name, uh, Suravira, Dr. Suravira. Yeah. The <laughs> operations were successful. And uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, this was a very successful story. And uh, now, it was a truly multidisciplinary, you know, project, and uh, there were various departments involved in the university, in the uh, science faculty, uh, the chemistry department, and the computer science department, and then in the engineering department, the mechanical engineering department got involved, and then uh, allied health the faculty, and then. Uh, I think uh, the what is uh, the Peradino Hospital doctors they got involved, and uh, what we did was uh, you know from the X-ray photographs that were taken in the hospital, the computer science department uh, produced uh, 3D images. They were constructed, and then according to those models, joints were manufactured using a stainless steel in the mechanical engineering department. Then our task in the chemistry department was uh, the development of a technique to coat this uh, stainless steel, uh, you know, prosthesis, to coat them with uh, a layer of apatite so that uh, the, you know, the prosthesis will be compatible with the body because apatite is uh, it has the same composition as a bone. So <clears throat> that was the, you know, the project. And uh, now I, I have to mention that this project was initiated and coordinated by Professor Gandhi Rajabaksha. And uh, now <clears throat> along with this, uh, we developed a technique called atomized spray pyrolysis. And uh, this term, atomized spray pyrolysis, is a technical term coined by our group. And uh, this was not in existence uh, before that. And uh, this is a novel coating technique. And uh, it was developed at Vera Denia. And uh, with this technique, one can make thin films of various materials like titanium dioxide, tin, tin oxide, zinc oxide, or apatite, or many other materials. And in certain cases, you can also produce transparent films. That is another important aspect. We were able to produce transparent uh, films because of this technique. And then when you have transparent films of various materials like titanium dioxide and so on, they will be very useful in solar cells and various other display devices. And uh, for example, if you take titanium dioxide, you know, P25, that's a 
titanium dioxide nanoparticle with uh, 20, about 25 nanometer particle size. If you do a normal ordinary spraying, you will get the opaque white film. But with this technique that we have developed, that is uh, atomized spray pyrolysis, we can get the glass-like transparent film. And uh, this is the basic technique. Now, on the left, this is the usual spray method. You have a spray nozzle, and you have the solution, and uh, you use this compressed air, and you have a substrate. It may be heated, and you do a direct spray. The problem with this method is, you know, even larger particles and agglomerates can come out and can deposit on the film. But with the method that we developed at Veradenia, uh, it avoids, you know, the expulsion of large particles or agglomerates. And uh, what comes out of the spray head is a very fine uh, mist-like uh, output. So therefore, the, the film that you get is very nice and very smooth. And in certain cases, it is transparent. And uh, I will show you this uh, atomized spray pyrolysis instrument now <clears throat> in a video. Is it all right? Yes, can you sir. see now? Yeah. Yes, sir. yes, we can see. Yeah, this is an instrument. And uh, here you have the control panel heaters and so on. And uh, on the right, you have we have used the you know heater here, and the substrate is mounted on that. And uh, when this is played, you can see the spray is coming through that tube, and uh, that black thing there is what's being sprayed. I, I think this is some graphite or something like that. But uh, you can see the. The substrate is moving to and fro, and the vapor is coming through this flexible tube. And uh, it's coming from this uh, atomizer here. And uh, inside the atomizer, there's a mechanism to prevent larger particles coming out. And uh, so the fine vapor is coming through the flexible tube, and it's going on to the substrate. And uh, so this is the instrument, this is just one of the instruments that we uh, manufactured at Peradenia for making transparent uh, thin films. Uh, as was made by this technique and uh, there are two pictures here, SCM pictures. The top one is the commercial one. And this is what we prepared. And uh, what we prepared had a good conductivity and transparency. And subsequently, we used them in solar cells. And then uh, uh, we made this uh, fluorine top tin oxide on <coughs> soda and glass using this atomized Pyro, uh, atomized spray pyrolysis technique. And uh, we made uh, solar cells with this. And uh, this also published in this uh, Journal of Physical Chemistry. And then uh, a little bit about supercapacitors. Uh, this is a project uh, funded by the cord chain. And uh, this is a supercapacitor. I think uh, you know how it works. And there are two electrodes. And then uh, the electrodes are coated with a high porous material such as uh, activated carbon on both sides. And then uh, there's electrolyte in the middle and there's a separator, which may be cellulose or something like that. And uh, what happens is when you apply a potential, uh, if you take the positive side, the activated carbon will get a positive charge. And uh, because it's having a high, high surface area, the negative ions from the electrolyte will come and settle on the surface. They will be 
forming a double layer there yeah, and uh, similarly the positive ions will go to the negative electrode and uh, uh, the applied potential is should be low enough that there is no electrolysis or there is no decomposition of the electrolyte and there is no discharge or there are no chemical reactions at the electrode and uh, this way the device can store a large amount of uh, charge and these are called supercapacitors and uh, we made this supercapacitors on this project and uh, the supercapacitors have very high power density and uh, they can provide very large current at this uh, in a short time and then uh, you know there are various applications for these supercapacitors now and uh, here you can see some of the supercapacitor electrodes that we prepared and this is uh, activated carbon and we had to develop a method here so that uh, we get this uh, thin film of uh, activated carbon uh, it should adhere to the aluminium foil and it should not come off and the resistance should not be high and uh, when you add the electrolyte it should not peel off and there are various uh, conditions like that and we were able to develop methods so that finally we got good quality electrodes and then uh, using this we made this uh, super capacitors and this uh, one that we made and this is a commercial one this is 10 farad and what we made here this is 23 farad and there are a few others here so that way we perfected the method for making the super capacitors and uh, now here you can see the charge discharge curves and the CVs of these are they are ideal and uh, the curves here show that uh, the device is very good the performance is quite good and uh, so it is a 23 farad mine uh, you know the common uh, electrolytic capacitors that you find are actually <clears throat> microfarad range. So these are farad range. So the capacity is about million times higher than the conventional one. And then <clears throat> the earlier ones that I showed you, they are, uh, we were using organic electrolytes, but uh, this one, this uh, supercapacitor again is a big one. And uh, here we used an aqueous electrolyte and uh, the things that you have in this are only stainless steel and then activated carbon and the electrolyte and uh, it can store very high charge and the size is about 10 centimeters and 10 centimeters and the height is about five centimeters and uh, this was done on the Cortian project which is coordinated by Professor Rajapaksha and I have to mention that Professor Premaratna was also working for this project for some time and uh, these supercapacitors were you know, the, the work was done by uh, our research assistant, uh, Nadisha Gunavardhan. And uh, again, I have to show you a, a small video. Now they are going to start this motorbike. So the supercapacity is now starting the motorbike. Okay, then we will continue. So if you just open the PowerPoint, we will see, sir. Okay. Can you see? Uh, it's opening. So yes, sir. We can okay. see it. So that's the supercapacitor that we made. And then uh, <laughs> there's another instrument, uh, a BET surface area analyzer that we 
made in the faculty and uh, now this is based on the BET method that is Brown Emmett Teller and uh, this is related to the absorption of gases by solid surfaces and uh, we use a mixture of nitrogen and helium and uh, nitrogen partial pressure is kept below 0.3 and uh, so that uh, is the condition for getting a monolayer. And uh, <clears throat> there are commercial instruments uh, costing about millions of rupees. And uh, now this is the block diagram of this one. And uh, we have a mixture of uh, you know helium and nitrogen coming from here through a flow meter. And then it goes through one of the two you know, sample holders. And uh, so one can contain the sample to be measured and the other a standard sample of known surface area. And uh, then the outgoing gas is passing through a sensor and then it goes out through this, uh, this second flow meter. Okay, and then uh, <clears throat> what we normally do is uh, we take the sample and it to about 150 degrees for about half an hour so that all the adsorbed gases are expelled. And when all the gases are expelled, then uh, you note that the, all the incoming gases will be going out. So there will be a constant flow about the sensor. And then what we do is we immerse this in a liquid nitrogen diva and cool it to liquid nitrogen temperature. And uh, when it is cooled, what will happen is nitrogen will be absorbed by the sample and uh, depending on the surface area and, uh, and the amount that you have in the sample tube. And uh, then what will happen is during the absorption, the flow rate will decrease. And then when everything has been absorbed, it will come back to the original flow rate. So the sensor measure, measures the flow rate, uh, rather the pressure. And uh, using the Bernoulli principle here, is the sensor, is the flow. If the flow is fast, then the pressure is low. If the pressure is, uh, sorry, flow is slow, the pressure is high. So using that relationship, uh, we calculate the amount of gas absorbed by the sample, and it is compared with the non material and from that you can get the specific surface area. And uh, again, I don't know, <laughs> there's a machine to this machine. These are the two sample holders. And then uh, these are the heaters and these are the divas for the uh, liquid helium. And uh, these are the flow meters and this is the heater control. And this is a touch pad for controlling the instrument. And uh, what we normally do is uh, we can rotate this uh, stage containing the heaters and the divas, and uh, they can be brought into position and the heater or the diva can be raised. And if you raise the heater, you can heat the sample. And if you raise the diva, you can cool the sample. And uh, so the, you can control the instrument through this touch pad and uh, automatically a graph will be drawn uh, representing the change in the volume. And uh, from that, you can get the specific surface area. And uh, I'll try for you to see that. And uh, now one of the heaters can be raised After heating, it can be lowered. And then the diva can be brought to position. And 
then the diva can be raised to cool the sample. So that's the instrument and uh, we'll stop it there and go back to the this uh, slides. Okay. Now, these are the curves that you get from the instrument. And uh, by comparing the area under the curves, you can get the surface area. Can you see the graph? Hello? Yes, yes sir. sir. And uh, this uh, machine was constructed by one Jayakant who got the MPhil degree for this one. And uh, recently they submitted it uh, to the International Innovation and Invention Show in TAG 2021. And uh, they won the silver medal for that. And the work has been you know, published in Instrumentation Science and Technology, and it is available online. Okay, now a little bit about uh, what we did for the COVID. Now, with the onset of COVID, we thought that we should do something for the faculty. And uh, you know that uh, there should be, you know, hand washing and sanitizing and facilities everywhere. And uh, so we <coughs> manufactured a touch-free hand wash unit. And uh, this delivers automatically soap, then water, and hot air. And uh, you don't have to touch anything. And it was designed and constructed in the electronics lab of the chemistry department. and. Uh, the welding was done at the workshop. And uh, the first one that was manufactured was donated to the Department of Chemistry. And then we got funds to construct uh, seven more and uh, one for each department. And uh, I think they have been installed. And uh, all these were constructed uh, by our senior technical officer, Mahinda Parnavitarana. And, uh, some help was given by Dilan Vijayko. And uh, so these are very useful for the students to wash their hands. And uh, again, there's a video. I don't think uh, we have to go for that because we have, we have seen that in the department. And uh, I will skip it and go to our next project which was the oxygen concentrator. Now, you know that uh, with the onset of COVID, there's a great demand for oxygen now. And uh, the idea of uh, making an oxygen concentrator was actually, it came from uh, Professor Anand Kulasurya, who was uh, working in the department of uh, botany because he telephoned me about uh, six months back and he told me that uh, that's uh, you know the problem of this COVID, and uh, the doctors are saying that uh, in the future uh, we will be running out of oxygen. And is there a way to make oxygen in the laboratory? He put that question to me. So I was thinking about this, and then uh, it came to my mind that we had a liquid nitrogen machine in the chemistry department, and we have repaired it several times, and. Uh, uh, I knew that uh, it worked on a principle called PSA, that is a pressure swing adsorption technique. And uh, so there we extract nitrogen from atmosphere, we leave out oxygen and use nitrogen gas to make uh, liquid nitrogen. So obviously we can use the same technique to get the oxygen. We leave out the nitrogen and take the 
oxygen. So what I did was I looked at the literature, went through the internet to find that actually this method is being used to manufacture oxygen concentrators. So the oxygen concentrator, it takes air and uh, it uh, separates nitrogen and, and then get the oxygen. Then uh, I told this to Professor Rajapaksha and he has very good relations with the industry. So he immediately, you know, arranged the Zoom meeting. This was, I think, somewhere in May. And uh, so I was there, Professor Damini Rajapaksha, then Dr. Chamind Herat from Navalpiti Hospital, then Mr. Hemant Pereira from Sarsavi Industries, and then our technical officer, Mahindra Padnavitaran, and then uh, the person who made the BET machine, Ruan Jayakant. So we had this meeting <laughs> and we decided to, uh, you know, start the work. And uh, immediately the work was started and uh, most of the work was actually done by <laughs> Mahinda. And uh, it was done by Mahinda and Mr. Hemant Pereira of the Sarsavi Industries, he provided the solenoid valves, the tubings, and also he provided the oxygen analyzer to measure the percentage of oxygen. And uh, then there was a problem of getting zeolite because uh, it was very difficult to get zeolite because there was a very big demand all over the world for that. And we got down some uh, you know, stuff, but it was not of the correct type. And then fortunately I contacted the, our Professor Madhava Megas Kumar, who was in the uh, zoology department earlier. And uh, then when I told him the problem, he kindly agreed and then uh, he did everything and he uh, you know, shipped some uh, about 10 kilograms of the required high quality uh, zeolite. And we are using the zeolite for the absorption of nitrogen because the zeolite, uh, this particular type of zeolite, it uh, preferentially absorbs nitrogen and leaves out oxygen. And uh, so now for COVID patients to facilitate breathing, you know, if the oximeter shows uh, oxygen saturation below about 96%, uh, uh, it is considered low and they need to be treated with oxygen. And uh, the, you know, the usual source of oxygen is uh, cylinders but uh, oxygen can be produced on small scale using this pressure swing adsorption. And uh, portable machines producing 95 to 96 pure percentage pure oxygen at uh, three to 10 liters per minute, uh, they are common. And uh, we started the work to you know, manufacture a machine that can deliver about five liters per minute of oxygen. And uh, this is the block diagram. And there are two canisters containing the zeolite. And then uh, these are the connections. And uh, this, uh, what uh, shown in red, they are the valves. And these are constrictors to constrict the flow. And these two are also valves. So what we do is compress the air. It should be dried. And it's pumped into one of these cylinders at a time. So this valve is open. The other one is closed. And uh, this cylinder gets pressurized. As it gets pressurized, what will happen is nitrogen is adsorbed and oxygen comes out. And that oxygen is taken out to the outlet. And while this is being pressurized, we depressurize the other one and the nitrogen that was earlier adsorbed will come out through this valve and it comes out to the atmosphere. And uh, we repeat the cycle. Then we open this valve and pressurize this one and depressurize the other one. And this cycle is repeated uh, about every six seconds. And uh, then we will get a constant output of oxygen that will eventually go into a buffer tank, then to a filter. It will go through a filter. And then uh, finally, it can be used by a patient. 
and uh, so we got the parts for all this. So we had the zeolite and uh, <clears throat> then the prototype oxygen concentrator was built. And uh, now the valves here, they were provided by uh, this uh, Mr. Hemant uh, and they're controlled by a uh, Arduino board. And uh, the prototype we have made, it is in the nano lab. It produces up to 96% pure oxygen at uh, four liters per minute maximum. And uh, this is the maximum percentage of uh, oxygen purity then that we can take because we can't remove the argon in the air and uh, only nitrogen is removed. So we are left with uh, the maximum 96% oxygen and we have achieved that. And uh, to look at air, yeah, contains 78% nitrogen, 21% of oxygen, 1% argon. And when you remove the 78% of nitrogen, you are left with the mixture containing 21% of oxygen and 1% argon. And so there, if you calculate the percentage out of 22 parts, you have 21 parts of oxygen, and that comes to 95.5 percentage of maximum. That's the maximum purity of oxygen that you can get, and we are getting that. And uh, there's a video of that also. If you like, I can show you that. And uh, we had a meeting yesterday with uh, Professor Rajapaksha, myself, and uh, Dr. Anathunga uh, in the uh, science uh, industry interaction cell, and uh, another investor and uh, is willing to invest and uh, Mr. Hemantha uh, of Sarasar Industries is also willing to fund this. And uh, we hope that uh, in the near future, we will be able to uh, manufacture uh, these machines in Sri Lanka. Yeah, uh, these are the two canisters containing uh, zeolite and they actually, we used uh, PVC tubes. It's a pressure gauge. These are the solenoid uh, valves. And uh, and this is the Arduino board and the, the relays controlling the valves. And this is the oxygen analyzer. And we are getting about 95% pure oxygen and uh, at a rate of close to four now. And uh, so it's fairly working all right. This is the first prototype we made and uh, we are going to improve on it and uh, we are planning to make a complete instrument with all the displays and uh, we need to have alarms and uh, the WHO requirements are there. There should be alarms for power failure and low oxygen concentration and high pressure, low pressure, and so on. So we have to include all that. And uh, so we are designing the next uh, instrument uh, that will deliver at least five liters of oxygen per minute. So this is there in the nano lab. And uh, I'll show another one if you have time. This oxygen analyzer is about $100. Okay. So that's the oxygen concentrate. And uh, then uh, 
Can I have about five minutes more or have I taken too much time? Uh, no, sir, uh, you can take the time you want. Uh, That's fine. Just uh, this, uh, nothing about instruments, just, just uh, something to inspire everybody because uh, yeah, sure. something about the sizes of atoms and molecules. And, uh, you know, as chemists and scientists, uh, we always talk about the, uh, you know, we work with atoms and molecules, but, uh, you know, we never think about the real sizes. So we wonder whether, you know, we have a real feeling for the size of these molecules and atoms. Do we really have a real idea? Now, now if you take one mole, we talk about moles and one mole of water and this and so on. And if you take, say, one mole of water, that is just 18 grams. So that is about maybe two tablespoonfuls. That the amount of water contains 6.023 times 10 to the power 23 water molecules. We all know that, the Gardo number. Now, how big is this number? When we say 10 to the 23, we do not care very much, you know. 23 and 10 to the power 23, we don't see much difference. And uh, then on the other hand, how small is the water molecule? We have really no actual idea. Now, if you have a real life experience, then we can sort this out. Now, we will do a small calculation, this just to inspire you. And uh, how big is the Avogadro number? We will try to, you know, count this. Is there anybody who can count up to 10 to the power 23? In a few minutes or even this entire lifetime, there's nobody. And uh, we will do this experiment. Let's get the entire world population to count up to 10 to the power 23, okay? So that is the task, going to count up to 10 to the power 23. And uh, we will get the entire world population to do this. We will assume that the world population is 8 billion. Then, each of us can count up to 100 in one minute. That is reasonable. So each one of us in the world counting up to 100 in one minute. So we can all count up to 100 times, 8 times 10 to the power 9 in a minute. That's right, no? Then how many minutes we need to count one more? That is Avogadro number divided by this amount. So that's the number of minutes we need to count up to 10 to the power 23, the entire world population. Okay, you and me included. Now, so that's the number of minutes. We will divide it by 60 to get the hours. Divide by 24 to get days. Divide by 365 to get years. And you do this calculation and your answer will be 1.4 million years. Okay? 1.4 million years to count up to 6 times 10 to the power 23 if the entire world population get together to do that. You believe that. Huh? You have to believe that. And that is the, you know, you can now imagine how big is this number, 10 to the power 23. Right? It is beyond imagination. It's really very, very large. And on the other hand, then you can imagine how small should be a water molecule. In those two spoonfuls, table spoonfuls, you have 10 to the power 23 molecules. How small should they be? Okay. So that is something for you to think. Kalpaya can now be 10 to the power 142. So imagine that. 
Now, uh, before I finish, I will just very briefly tell you that uh, we have, you know, made a few other instruments in the labs during the last maybe 20 years. One diode array spectrometer, spectrophotometer in the visible range, and then a particle size analyzer uh, using the principle of dynamic light scattering, and then a reflectance spectrometer uh, again in the visible region. And uh, some of these are working and some of these are now outdated and you have to, you know, uh, uh, you have to sort of uh, do some repairs on them uh, to make them useful. And of course, uh, the diodary spectrophotometer is very useful and we have been using this for some time. And I think Dr. Ranatunga has seen this. And uh, some of the students who did the special degree maybe five, 10 years ago would have seen this. And uh, it's a diodary spectrometer and it has a source of light and uh, there is a slit either before the sample or after the sample. And there's a sample holder and there's a grating and the grating will separate the light into individual wavelengths. And uh, then the entire spectrum falls on what is called a diode array. It's a photo diode array. The diodes are sensitive to light. And uh, usually these diodes arrays that the one we used in the instrument, it contains 1024 diodes uh, from one end to the other. And uh, it's about, uh, I think 2.5 centimeters in length from here to here. So the light, the entire spectrum falls on these diodes and individual diode will produce a photo current and there is an associated uh, diode there for each diode. There's a condenser and it will be charged to a certain voltage. And the voltage to which this is charged depends upon the amount of light that has fallen on the diode. And uh, so the diode array is connected to a computer and uh, in a fraction of a second, you can treat all the diodes and get the intensity data and plot the uh, graph on the computer screen. And this is very quick compared to a conventional spectrometer that will take a few minutes to scan. But this one, these are commercially available, but even the one that we made can take a spectrum in a fraction of a second. And uh, it's very good for kinetic studies. And uh, <clears throat> now this is the instrument, opened up instrument. This is the light beam coming from here, and there has the slit here, and the light falls on the grating. This is the grating, and then the light, the wavelength separated, the entire spectrum falls on the diode array. Now, this is the diode array uh, imported from Japan, and uh, this has 1024 diodes uh, along its length. And uh, so, through the electronics, that we have developed here, the circuit. Uh, the spectrum can be read and uh, the data can be digitized and then taken into the computer and you can plot the graph. And uh, if you do a kinetic experiment, we have done this several times, the reaction between permanganate and oxalic acid, and you can uh, program the machine to take spectra maybe every five seconds or 10 seconds or whatever time interval you like, and it will plot the graph for you and it's very convenient for kinetic studies. And uh, I think uh, it's getting too much and I will just uh, stop uh, saying that uh, we have done uh, a number of major repairs and this was mentioned earlier by Professor Rajabaksha and we have saved millions of rupees to the university and two of the major repairs that we have done was one to the XRD machine and then the other one to the FTNMR, and uh, we prepared that uh, myself and Mr. Parnavitan. Eh? And uh, of course, now it is no longer there because the magnet has quenched because we could not afford to fill helium to this every year. Uh, but uh, we repaired these two instruments. And uh, otherwise, the university would have, have to spend 
you know, several million rupees to do that. And the uh, university was not able to do that. And then uh, we have also uh, uh, prepared the instruments uh, of various other faculties and universities. And uh, we have repaired instruments, uh, I think GC uh, chromatograph, uh, it's uh, the temperature controller. Uh, it belongs to the engineering faculty of our university and we repaired it in our electronics lab. And uh, we also repaired the power supply of uh, atomic absorption spectrometer belonging to the uh, 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 Moratua University. Okay. And uh, this is the diffractometer and this is the NMR that we repaired. And I think uh, that should be enough. And uh, thank you for your patience. And I am very sorry that I could not handle this uh, Zoom properly. And uh, we lost some time because of that. And uh, please excuse me for that. And thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and uh, thank you for this inspirational talk and especially uh, for putting the Avogadro's number into perspective perspective, I think. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, um, uh, invite our head of the department, um, Professor Manav Devi Ganehenage, to awake some memories about Sir and to speak a few words. Uh, dear Madam, it's over to you. Can you hear me? Yes, Madam. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Sir, for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, doing such an inspirational and uh, stimulating speech uh, in this evening. Uh, thank you, Melanie, for giving me a chance to express uh, my thoughts about uh, Professor HNB, sir, uh, and his presentation. Uh, I am uh, happy to express a few words, uh, not only as the head of the department, uh, but as one of his students. Uh, we are very grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experiences with us, sir. So don't worry about the technical issues uh, that we had to face. That is very common uh, for everyone. And uh, it was very interesting to hear about your uh, 40 years of uh, experience on your expertise in chemistry blended with uh, electronics. Uh, your comments are very important and uh, helpful, not only to the students, uh, but also uh, to us to improve ourselves uh, as uh, university teachers. And uh, I know many members at our community are at the uh, standstill in their progress and uh, your talk uh, seemed to provide much uh, needed help, sir. So um, uh, you uh, know the idea of initiating this uh, INSPIRE webinar, sir, that was to help our students identify the scientists or the academic uh, giant in them. So I'm pretty sure you hit the target of Inspire, sir. So, uh, and the other thing I want to tell uh, this audience that uh, sir was my undergraduate research supervisor and uh, probably sir, I don't know whether he remembers or not. I also was given the project on conversion of natural rubber into a conducting polymer. Uh, so I carried out uh, that project uh, under Sir's guidance. Now you can think that how old that project was. And then uh, I just remember I did the bromination part, but I didn't focus on that dehydrobomination. I just remember how I uh, was struggling uh, that previous night. I just talked with Dr. Vajir Serevatna was also just how I just spent my time for doing that research with uh, Sir. So it was really interesting. So uh, it's hard to put into words. Uh, how nice he was, uh, not only as a teacher, uh, but also as a humble gentleman and uh, an uh, academic giant, if, if I say. So uh, he's a kind-hearted, uh, soft-spoken, soft, uh, as you all know, and uh, charismatic person. You know that charisma is an essential quality of a successful person. He has that quality. So uh, there are many things uh, he, we, we have to learn from sir. So if I brief some, he was one of the best teachers I have ever met. I still remember how interesting it was to listen to his uh, lectures, especially inorganic chemistry lectures. I never forget certain inorganic concepts I learned from him. I still use 
those concepts in my teaching for uh, these undergraduate students. And uh, one thing I also notice he is not only a chemist and also not only a best teacher uh, and um, or the scientist here, yeah, but also he is an inventor, as you now notice, and also he is a fine engineer uh, with uh, his expertise in electronics. So now there's a big question for all of you, how he was just, uh, uh, just uh, like that, you know, that his main uh, area was chemistry, but uh, his knowledge in engineering side and electronics is uh, just unmeasurable. So that we all need to ask from him that how that was so. And the other thing is that, you know, uh, what a marvelous job he did uh, uh, in maintaining our LMR instruments uh, and other electronic items in the department. And then uh, uh, two of his inventions, you know, that came out uh, uh, during this pandemic, as you observe now, that is that uh, auto hand wash unit and the oxygen generators. So uh, it's uh, really interesting uh, to know all these uh, researchers and inventions. So he did even after his retirement. And uh, if you want to nominate any professor who did not stop coming to the university and work actively, even after his retirement, that is none other than Professor HNB Bandara. So the work he did for the national development is also so uh, immense. So you know that uh, he's very popular among uh, the A-level teachers as a control in chief examiner. So we have invited some teachers also for this presentation. And uh, uh, he's a, a very silent character, as you know, but he comes forward and uh, talks to the point whenever the need arises. I still remember uh, one of the best talks he gave on behalf of achieving the university teachers' rights. If university teachers get, a, get an attractive salary by now, that's because uh, these uh, teachers like Professor Bandara raised their voice at the right time against this brain drain uh, in Sri Lanka. So we are grateful to Sir in that way as well. So he's a very religious, as you all know, a loving character, not only to his family, but also to the society around him. So once again, on behalf of the Inspire team and the Department of Chemistry, thank you very much, Sir, for giving, a truly, for, for giving us a truly memorable evening. And I can see some, uh, some of your students are uh, watching you now from USA, even Vimalasiri family is there. Kubudu, Viranga, Swarna, uh, Vimalasiri, they all are now here in the audience because they are just uh, very interested to, uh, I think, hear your voice even. So I think other members in the audience also have many comments to mention uh, and uh, we'll give them also a chance to just uh, talk to you. And uh, uh, also I just would like to ask you, sir, that how you just, uh, uh, just uh, have this kind of expertise in uh, electronics and engineering inside, even if you are a chemist. So thank you very much again, sir, for coming here and then giving us uh, this uh, inspirational talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Andhavi and Professor Rajapaksha and all other staff members of the Department of Chemistry for all the help that was given to me during my you know, service in the department and uh, even after retirement. And they were very helpful and uh, I am thankful to all of you for that. And uh, finally, I should say that uh, I could not have achieved all this without the help from my wife, Padmini. And I like to thank her also on this occasion because I could not have achieved any of this without her help. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, give it over to the audience. If you have any comments or memories to share with Sir, you are welcome to unmute yourselves and ask questions from Sir directly. So this is the first time actually I'm without questions. Your, your presentation is so clear that I have no questions to ask. But one comment that I want to make is that I mean, when, uh, I'm an old teacher now. Uh, one of your students, uh, but whenever I have a doubt in science, in chemistry or any other research, I approach Pros Bandara. Uh, and uh, then once we discuss, or oh, he himself thinks uh, alone and sort out that problem, just maybe like Einstein used to do. So I still uh, practice that, that to uh, 
improve my research. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Professor Rajapaksha. Uh, any other comments or uh, uh, questions to sir from the audience? Um, um, so, yes, sir. Yeah, now, Professor Manav Devi asked me how I, you know, <coughs> I am, you know, yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, how I came, you know, how in, I was able yeah. to do all these instruments, and uh, I am so good in electronics and so on. How yes, did this sir. happen? And uh, yes. shall I answer that question yes, now? Sir, yes, yeah, sir. I think that's, now, that's a question uh, from all. So, you know, in my nature, I think even from my very early uh, childhood, that when I was a very small child going to school, and uh, when you started doing science in the, I think, grade eight, so after that, and whenever something was taught in the class, you know, I can remember those days for science, uh, we were taught, uh, you know, about this uh, microphone, for example, carbon powder microphones, and then earphones, things like that. And then hot fire ammeters, things like this. And whenever something is taught in the class, when I come home, the first thing I do is try to make them. So in, our, in my childhood, I have made, you know, hot wire ammeters, this carbon powder microphones, and whatever that was taught in the class, if it can be made in the at home, then I did that. So this uh, habit culmin culminated in me gradually, and then uh, uh, later I had an interest in... Uh, you know, radio communication, and uh, I used to, when I was a small child, I used to put up a wire at the top of our house. People had that problem. Pardon? Yeah. Pardon? I guess that's not for you, sir. Ah, okay. Then, uh, and, uh, then I tried to get, uh, you know, Get, make a small radio. So, you know, you might remember those days there were what are called crystal sets. You can find uh, the silicon crystals or even you can try with uh, certain, uh, you know, particles, uh, black particles that are, you know, along with sand. Uh, these are semiconductive materials. There are, you know, something like uh, graphite or carbon which act as semiconductors and diodes. And uh, if you take one of those and put a pin on it at one place and press it on to that and connect two wires, one to the that uh, piece of uh, mineral, whatever it is, and one to the uh, pin, it acts as a diode. And uh, when you couple it to a small coil and uh, uh, you know earphone, you can listen to Radio Ceylon. I used to do that when I was very small. That was called a crystal set. And uh, that was the first radio that I made. Using, uh, you know, something, you know, picked from the sand and a pin and uh, then a piece of coil and, uh, you know, your phone. And then uh, when I came to the university, you know, I got a friend who did physics and uh, he also was interested in making radio. So we were roommates and uh, we got together, we went to Candy and bought, you know, radio parts and we started making, you know, small FM radios. Uh, not, uh, yes, uh, AM radios, amplitude modulation, not frequency modulation, those this AM radios we used to make. And, uh, you know, when we were very small, you know, we did not have radios at our homes, you know, only few few homes in the village had a radio too. And we also did not have a radio, but uh, I made the radio for the for our house. 
when I was doing, I think uh, when I was uh, in A level also, I made a small radio for the for our home. And uh, so I got interested in electronics and uh, I started reading. I learned all this by myself. And you know, I think uh, Professor Rajbaksha knows that I have done only botany, zoology, and chemistry for my first year, the GSQ, those days, right? So I did not do any physics after A level. But all these things I did by self studies and uh, physics, certain aspects I used to read. And then uh, later electronics, I learned electronics by myself. I always practiced, tried to make whatever I learned. And then when, uh, when, uh, when I got to know about, uh, you, you know, this uh, digital electronics, I got very much interested in that. These electronic gates, uh, and gates, O gates, and gates, and all these things, and then uh, various things that you can build out of these things. So I read about these things and started making them at home. And then, uh, you know, I was very much interested in uh, electronics, and then uh, that led me to interfacing the electronics, and then instruments. How to interface them? How to control instruments? Uh, using computers. And I learned that by myself, by reading books and by practice. And that's how I learned. And uh, so I think it was a you know, great thing that uh, I had acquired such a vast knowledge on electronics and also digital electronics and instrumentation and interfacing. And I have done also a little bit of uh, computer programming and uh, I can remember when you were small, I think when we entered the university, we got the first computer that we had. It was called Commodore 64. Commodore 64, a small computer, a small box like this, and a TV screen as the monitor. And uh, it is called 64 because its memory was 64 kilobytes. Remember, 64 kilobytes. The entire RAM was 64 kilobytes. And uh, it was there in the department. Uh, one was given to our department. And I was interested in this. I read the handbook and I learned programming. And that is how I started programming. And then uh, I first started programming in BASIC. That was the language that was popular at that time, BASIC. That's called Beginners All Purpose instruction code. And then uh, there was advanced basic uh, various versions. I learned those. And then uh, later I learned a little bit about C programming, C++. And then uh, I came to visual programming in basic. There was uh, you know visual basic available. And you can do Windows-like programming using uh, visual basic. So I got interested in that. and. I learned that, and uh, then uh, 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 instrumentation. And uh, once I knew how to interface and you know control things using computers, I started making instruments. And all the things that I have made in the electronics lab are our designs. And uh, we have uh, not only the instruments, we have more than maybe 20 new electronic experiments we have designed for the students who are learning computer science and interfacing. And in fact, uh, when I was uh, you know, knowledgeable about all these things, uh, I introduced this uh, CS206, CS Computer Science 206 on digital electronics and you know, interfacing. And uh, I don't know that uh, maybe still there. And uh, it was I who introduced that course for the computer science students, that is CS206. And where we talked about these gates and then flip flops and then counters and all, the, all these things and uh, how to uh, up to interfacing. 
and then analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion. And these are the basic things that you should know when you want to control instruments. So it's a great thing as science students, if you can learn at least a little bit of electronics, particularly uh, there's a digital electronics, and then some computer programming. And if you have a knowledge of chemistry and some electronics and then programming, and that's the best combination you can have. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, uh, for the for telling us your uh, story, how you became uh, equally knowledgeable in both electronics and chemistry, um, and uh, I apologize uh, from the audience for not uh, being able to like uh, giving you permission to unmute yourselves. But now you can, so please uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and give your comments to sir or uh, ask questions. I just want to say something uh, about Professor. Bandara's teaching, he never mentioned the workload he handled. I can remember somewhere in 1990s, he was the only inorganic chemist in the department. I think Professor Lepro was on leave, sabbatical leave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Professor uh, uh, R.P. Gunadhan was the dean, yeah, but he yeah. did some yeah. lectures. Yeah, yeah. I can yeah. remember Professor Bandara handled entire organic inorganic area. Yeah, yeah. I can remember the <laughs> There was a period of about six months, actually. There was nobody except me in the inorganic year. Including external practicals. Both, yeah. both degree and GSQ level you did alone. So that's another kind of inspiration for the teaching staff. The workload he handled. Yeah, I did all the exams I can remember. Hello, Professor. Uh, Bandar, uh, I'm Pali. Hello, and, uh, how are you? Nice to see you. Hey, nice, nice seeing you. Too. <laughs> and uh, it, you, as a person, is a very inspiring person. And the, the, this presentation was done perfectly. And uh, I learned so much about you. And it was a good thing for the students and staff and everybody else, including me. Thank you so much. And uh, just a simple question. Maybe a selfish one. How come you didn't do physics? Uh, I my interest was in chemistry actually, so I couldn't do it even as sub because uh, I didn't do it for the first year hmm. because you were not allowed to do physics during those days. Oh, I see. You were the mission was there between you know bio and physical students. So we could not do physics. Oh, you were not allowed to do it? Yeah, we were not allowed to do it. Oh, science unless, unless you have a good maths I knowledge. Know. Some people, I think, I don't know. One of our batchmates did it. He did physics, maths, and chemistry. Uh, mm. He did maths. That's why he did. Yeah. I see. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, can I say a word? This is Ratnak Bandara speaking. Yeah. Uh, HMN. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In fact, you know, it was quite, you know, <clears throat> amazing that uh, what you have achieved and what you have done. Uh, I just want to tell Professor Rajapaksas and a uh, <clears throat> few others mentioned, uh, Professor Manadevi also, that you are an excellent teacher. Uh, when I was, you, know, you taught us uh, boron chemistry, I still remember. And uh, boron. boron, boron, yeah, boron, not, boron, not boring, boring. No, it's not, it's not boring. Yeah, yeah, not boring. <laughs> 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 yeah, boring. boron chemistry, and I still remember, you know, the three the concepts that you uh, taught us. Uh, I was just uh, a final year, or maybe third year student then. Uh, three yeah. center bonds, five center bonds. Exactly, center three center bonds. I understood, and uh, I got, uh, I developed some interest in organic chemistry. But uh, other areas, of course, uh, somehow I got to organic chemistry. Anyway, that's one thing. Another point is not, uh, is that uh, uh, you are a 
I mean, when we have any problems in life and various other things, we go to you for help and uh, advice. So that was uh, another uh, aspect in your life, uh, probably didn't come out here. So that is another uh, point that I want to mention. <clears throat> and also, uh, uh, the, you are the sharing not only your knowledge, whatever you have, you used to share with us. So when you are in trouble and when we don't have things, whatever you produce in your garden or, you know, anything. So uh, with all that, uh, I thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to uh, our gratitude to convey our gratitude to Professor H. M. Bandara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Um... And uh, let me read uh, some of the comments in the chat box for you, sir. Yeah. Uh, it, there's uh, uh, attendee uh, Lalit. Uh, thank, uh, uh, thanks you for um, like for the talk. And uh, uh, he says that, uh, sir, you were the one uh, that was in charge of his final year research on neural networks and pH absorbance, sir. Oh, right. uh, and uh, uh, again, a, a Flamington tells that uh, Professor Bandar is a great MacGyver. So those are the some of the comments that we received on the chat box. Uh. Thank you. Yes, another um, one by Diniti. Diniti Rajapaksha. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, uh, let me read that. Uh, yes, yeah. Diniti yeah, Diniti, uh, is thanking uh, you, sir, for everything. And uh, she says, we cannot even imagine how you managed everything. Thank you for, uh, thank you very much for teaching undergraduates even after your retirement. If not, we could have missed the chance to learn from you. Once again, thank you very much, sir, for everything. This is from Diniti. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any more comments or questions from the audience? Um, if it's okay, I would like to speak a few words about Professor Chiman Bandara. So, Professor Bandara, uh, I'm Ranga, uh, the younger son of Swarna. So, um, uh, right now I'm working, I'm sorry, but. Uh, the thing that I want to tell you is that I wanted to say how humble Professor Chiman Bandara was. So he, he's really special to me personally because he's one of the handful of lecturers who taught my mother, my father, my brother, and myself. So, so <laughs> you're a wonderful person and you're a wonderful teacher. We always talk about you all the time. And I remember one time, like I, I wanted to tell everyone about how devoted you are to the university temple because i remember once uh, we i think it was during cutting the time we were repairing the uh, the back cover behind the buddha rupa and uh, we needed something from the store and like those days we didn't have any vehicles or anything but we were helping there and like without even without any hesitation you gave me your car key to get an instrument from the store in Perdinia city and I was really surprised by that because uh, that's not that's not something that I usually see. But we are really supportive to everything. Uh, like uh, any, if there's any program that's been handled in the temple, I see your face there for sure. And I know how devoted you are to the temple. I mean, I see you all the time when I go there, and I I I love that quality about you. And even in the university, if there's any issue in electronics in our department, I see your face there for sure. So I I, I would love to say, I mean, I, I uh, you taught me in my second year and my first year. So I, I mean, you were one of the best teachers that I ever had. And I, 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 I love your way of teaching. I love how humble you are and how devoted you are to the temple as a Buddhist. And I mean, I... I me personally, I, I, I expect nothing uh, less than that from you because you're one of the, great, the greatest teachers that I had. So, I mean, we, we are in this place right now because of your teachings. So I just want to say thank you and we'll do our best to uphold your reputation. And I wish you all the best in life. I mean, you're retired and you're still teaching in the university. That's why, that's how you actually taught me. 
uh, for the last time in my in my uh, family line. So I I thank you for that. And again, I, I'm I'm so happy that you're still with the department. You know, uh, teaching and doing these lectures. And I would like to thank the Inspire team to uh, for uh, inviting you, sir, to speak uh, on behalf of everyone. And I wish you all the best in life. Thank you. Thank you, Iranji, so much. Thank you for your words, kind words, and all the best for you in your study. Thank you so much, sir. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> um, thank you, Viranga. And uh, as uh, Viranga said, uh, sir, we are like we we are very lucky to have had the honor of learning from you during our undergrad years, and uh, you you are an inspiration to many of us, sir. I would like I to read. Uh, I would like to read a few comments again, sir. Uh, and then uh, if there aren't any questions, we will uh, uh, give it over to Hari. Uh, so there, there, there's uh, one uh, participant says, uh, I am Subhadra, your batchmate. It was inspiring to listen, listen to your achievement. And another attendee says, sir, great piece of research, best wishes. So those are some of the other comments. Hi. She's a batchmate of mine. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, that's what she yeah. said. Yeah. Um, if we don't have any more comments or questions. Uh, can I say something? Yes, yes. yes uh, sure. uh, another batchmate, uh, my name oh. is uh, Sirisoro. Uh, from USA. Yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, what I like to say is a little bit different uh, because I knew Bandar for a long time now. Uh, I usually do not uh, join Zoom discussions, but uh, because of Bandar, I thought of joining and then finding out what he has done over the years. One thing I want to say is that whenever we had chemistry problems, we go to Bandar at, the, at those times. But more than that, he was uh, one of the very ethical persons I have seen. I have never seen him doing anything wrong uh, in the past, the, I mean, we were doing all sorts of things, but he was one of those who uh, I could always trust. His word, uh, his actions, everything was very ethical. I think it is an important point because as a scientist, as scientists, uh, including myself, I do all sorts of things, uh, but uh, to be ethical, to be honest, to uh, keep the word, is paramount actually, it's more important than science. So I just want to point out because this is an audience of a lot of uh, students and uh, faculty also. Uh, over the years, what I have learned is that that is more important than science. So Bandar, I admire him. I uh, kind of is a model for him in that respect. Just want to share that with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Bandar. Thank Very you, nice Andy. work. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, very much for that nice comment. Um, with that, I would like to uh, hand it over to Harit um, to uh, deliver the word of thanks on behalf of the students. It is a great honor and privilege for me to present the vote of thanks to this webinar on behalf of the Department of Chemistry, University of Peradeniya, and members of the INSPIRE team. First and foremost, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our dear sir, Professor Chairman Bandara for accepting our invitation and for that most inspirational talk given. Thank you, sir, for spending your valuable time with us and sharing your valuable experience of teaching, learning, and research over the past 40 years. We found this webinar to be very informative, motivating, and excellent guidance for young scientists who are just entering the field of science to advance their careers and find their paths. Professor HMN Bandara, sir, thank you very much for honoring us with your inspirational webinar. Next, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Ganehenage, head of the Department of Chemistry, for hosting the invited speaker and guiding us throughout the entire Inspire webinar series. I would also like to thank the attendees for supporting us with their presence, and I'm confident you found this informative webinar beneficial. Before winding up today's session, I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to to our next INSPIRE webinar, which will be held on 16th of September, 2021 at 5 p.m. The invited speaker for the next webinar will be Professor LMV Tilakaratna from University of Toledo, United States. This talk is titled, Drug Discovery, a Chemist Perspective. 
Thank you all. Have a great evening.